Hi there, Donovan. I watch your channel when I can, and I'm really glad I'm finally able to contribute. I've been an avid hiker and an outdoor enthusiast for a long time. I've always wondered if I'd come across anything odd or supernatural. I think I finally have, and I'm wondering what my next step should be. I'm on a countrywide road trip in my decked out van. I started my journey in California, and I'm ending here in Maine. After this week, I'm going to sell my van to a guy over here on the East Coast and catch a flight to New Zealand. I'm able to finance my travels by exchanging farm help for accommodation. Organic farms are usually short-staffed, and they always need all the extra help they can get. So I volunteer with them in exchange for food and a shower and maybe a little extra cash. I've done it all, from picking avocados to shearing sheep to swimming in a cranberry bog. It's a tough lifestyle, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm able to travel all around the world, and I get to meet a ton of cool and interesting people. I've been in Vermont for about three weeks now, and I was just getting ready to pack up. My host now is just as cool as the rest. He owns a maple syrup production business and grows sugar maples all on his property. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's about 30 acres, so it's pretty easy to get lost in. The farm is a relatively small operation, but there are a few part-time workers that lend a hand, even on other crops like the pumpkin patch and herb garden. There's no cell service, but there's a landline and a home computer inside that he lets me use. That's where I am now, as I'm writing to you. Maple syrup production is mainly done in the winter and early spring, so my host hires more farmhands in the beginning of the year. It's fall now, so there's not a ton to do. No bottling or boiling the sap, but there's a lot of basic farm tasks that need to be done. We've been trying to set up some new tap lines and have been rebuilding the sugar shack. I've also been tasked with chopping down some of the dead trees on the property and making them into firewood. On this particular day, I was tasked with hauling some cut logs back to the sugar shack. The farm has a really sweet pickup truck that they use to go around the property, so the job was kind of a piece of cake. I really only brought out my axe. Again, there's no cell service out there, so I left my phone in the house. I really wish I brought it, so I could take a picture and show you what I saw. You'll just have to take my word for it, though, unfortunately. I was only like five minutes into the woods when I started to hear this weird noise. It was like a static hum or a buzzing noise. I thought my ears were just ringing at first from going hunting earlier that week, but it kept on going and I could tell it just wasn't in my head. I thought maybe it was a plane going by or a strange cricket, but the sound was just too different than anything I've ever heard before. I kept working on the logs and hauling some pieces onto the truck, when curiosity got the best of me. I'll be honest, I didn't really want to investigate, because my host's wife was making pot pies for dinner, and I wanted to get my work done on time, but I just couldn't help myself. It was almost like I was drawn to it or something. I kept walking towards the noise. Luckily, the trees are marked and numbered, so I knew I'd be able to find my way back. The sound kept buzzing louder and louder, almost vibrating in my ears, until I eventually found myself in a clearing. Straight ahead of me was this whitish, bluish light glowing in the middle of the clearing, about three feet off of the ground. I could see through it, but there was like some electricity or energy pulsing in it. It was just about three feet tall too, and it was shaped like an oval. Around the light were these waves of movement, like heat coming off of the pavement. I was just stuck there staring at it for a minute when I finally snapped out of it. Like any idiot would, I decided to chuck a stick at it. The stick hit the thing and its shape glowed bright white. Then it was gone, but I didn't see the stick hit the ground. It was like it was sucked into it. I decided that was the moment for me to get out of there, so I quickly made my way back to the truck. When I parked back to the house, I told my host and his wife, but neither of them believed me. I convinced them to go with me and check it out, but by the time we got there, it was gone. In the place where it was, however, was a scorch mark. The grass was burnt, like something was lit on fire or poked with a torch. I know this sounds nuts, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm just glad I didn't drive or walk into it by accident. I'm heading out to Maine this week, but I told my host to keep an eye out for anything weird like that. 
I don't know what this was. Was it a portal or some type of energy field? I have no idea. Hey Donovan, I'm a fan and a frequent listener of your show. I especially like when the stories are about unexplained occurrences and creatures in the woods. I think if anyone spends enough time in the outdoors, they'll eventually come across some strange things, things that they can't explain. Whenever I sat around a campfire with my uncle as a kid, they'd tell me scary stories about things they saw in the forest. Well, now I have a story of my own to share. Almost everyone in my family owns property on the outskirts of the Finger Lakes National Forest. My backyard juts up against it. The forest sits on a ridge called the Backbone, between Lake Seneca and Lake Cayuga. My family has been hunting and trapping the area for five or six generations. We joke that the forest is our ancestral lands, because we've been here for so long. In the early spring, I hike up to the peak of the Backbone and set beaver traps along the stream that flowed down into the lakes. My family used to make most of its money on beaver pelts at the turn of the century. Now it's just a hobby for us that has been passed down for generations. I'm actually an accountant by day. I'm sure my great-great-grandparents are horrified. I check my traps early every morning before I head into work. On days that I work from home, I'll sometimes check them again before sunset. Last season, I was walking my trap line before work when I saw some disturbing things. The traps that were triggered all had mostly eaten beaver carcasses in them. Blood, bone, and shredded beaver meat littered the rocks and weeds around the traps. It looked like someone shoved their bodies through a wood chipper. It was a grisly scene, but nothing so far from the ordinary that I should be spooked. Predators getting into your trap line is a regular problem. What did startle me about the situation was the scent left behind and the damage done to the traps themselves. My traps are heat-treated steel, built for heavy use, but they still had massive gashes and dents in them. No animal, not even a bear, has enough power in its jaws to crumple steel like that. The traps had an oily coating on them that smelled like this rancid meat. At first, I thought it was the beaver carcasses, but the kills were too fresh to smell already. Whatever creature had ransacked my line left behind a distinct smell of musty, rotten meat. I talked to my uncles about the incident, and one of them reported a similar situation. Ransacked traps and the smell of rancid meat. His trap line was not far from mine, so it was an easy jump to assume the same animal that destroyed my trap line did the same thing to his. This happened twice more, as we began to joke that a zombie bear was roaming the hills. We laughed about it, but I was starting to get spooked, and I could tell my uncles were too. We decided we need to figure out what was going on, so we bought a bunch of trail cams and placed them around our traps. They were simple motion-activated cameras that would snap a picture of anything moved inside their field of vision. For a few weeks, we didn't see anything. It wasn't even beaver season anymore, but we kept throwing out traps anyway. I'm not advocating poaching, but we really wanted to find out what this thing was. Finally, one of our cameras caught something. I knew we had something before I even looked at the camera when I saw the ransacked trap. The familiar smell of rotting meat was present, and I found patches of hairy skin hanging from low branches and bushes. It looked like the creature's skin was molting off, like in those nature documentaries when the snakes shed out of their skin. I took the SD card out of the camera and nearly ran the whole way back to my car and sped home to see what was on it. The pictures weren't the best quality, but you could clearly make out a dog wolf-like head with these eyes glowing in the moonlight. But there was something wrong with the way it was built. It wasn't just that it was way too big to be a dog or a coyote. It had a huge hump on its back and it was very broad like human-like shoulders. The camera was black and white so I couldn't tell what color the creature was. But the picture was clear enough to see that the thick fur around its head and neck thinned out around the body to show light-colored, maybe gray skin underneath. There isn't much else I could tell from the first picture, but a succession of photos taken as the creature moved showed that it could even stand on its hind legs. I thought we had solid proof of a wolf-human hybrid. I sent the pictures to the Fish and Game Commission, 
and the National Forestry Service, and some local news outlets. Nobody took it seriously. The local news was the only one to run the story, but they treated it as more of a joke. I'm not even angry about it, honestly. I'd assume it was just photoshopped or something if I saw the pictures. A park ranger I knew took a look at the pictures and checked out the site of the traps with me, but he said it was probably a black bear with a bad skin infection, like mange that was making it look and smell like that. But I've since become an expert on bear anatomy after obsessively trying to figure it out and no bear is built like that creatures I have pictures of. The legs and the shoulders are too human-like. I used to hike and camp a lot in those woods. I still hunt and trap, but I always carry a rifle on me now. I never spend the night in the trees. I have a story to share with you that has been bothering me for almost five years now. I live in the rural town of Inwood, Iowa, where everyone knows everyone and loves to gossip. So for obvious reasons, I'd rather not give out my name. I hope that's okay. I turned 16 in the summer of 2017 and got my driver's license. Anyone who's ever been to Inwood would tell you there's not a whole hell of a lot to do there, or really anywhere to go. But having my driver's license at the very least meant that I could get out of the house and off of the farm once in a while. Usually the day would wind up with me picking a bunch of my friends up and we just cruise up and down the dirt roads until the gas light came on, or one of us got a call from our parents to head home. Life in Inwood isn't all that exciting, but it's pretty safe. That's how I wound up in the situation I found myself in the first place. I was driving around that morning just like any other, waiting for my friends to answer their phones, so I could start gathering them up. It was getting near the 4th of July, so the fireworks stands were in full swing and I thought it would be fun to buy a few and blow some up down by the lake. Unfortunately, though, my friends weren't as enthusiastic and seemed to be sleeping in late, ignoring me and my texts altogether. I didn't want to be at home, though Dad was working on a new irrigation system for the farm, and I knew if I showed my face he'd want me to help. So I got my car and I went for a drive on my own. I decided to head down some country roads I'd never explored before, and see what I could find. I knew the little town of Inwood well, but there were all kinds of farms and interesting landmarks. I figured I might as well use my time looking for them. It didn't take me long to run across something I never expected. As I came over a steep hill south of town, I laid my eyes on the most beautiful farmscape I'd ever seen. It wasn't a modern farm by any means. There were no signs of tractors or machinery of any kind. It looked exactly like the kind of farmscape you'd see in some turn-of-the-century painting. At the top of the hill sat a huge white house with a wraparound porch. Off to the east side of the house was a giant red barn, and the yard was peppered with chickens out clucking and scratching the ground, and there was a tidy little lush garden laid out in the front lawn. I didn't even notice the old woman standing in the yard until I got right up to the place, and by then it was too late to stop or turn around. It turned out the house was on a dead-end road, and the only hope I had of driving away from it was to come to a stop in the old lady's driveway and turn around. As I came to a stop, she came right up alongside the car and tapped on my window. It would have been impolite not to roll down the window and talk to her. This is a beautiful car, she said to me, as if she knew who I was. In truth, the car wasn't anything special. It was an old hand-me-down Toyota my parents had given to me, with rust along the bumper. I thanked her and started to apologize for driving down her road, explaining that I was just out for a cruise. None of that mattered to her. She seemed thrilled to have me there and insisted that I come inside. Inwood being the polite and safe town that it is, I didn't think twice about it. After all, what else did I have to do that day? Inside the house, everything was immaculately clean, but also old-fashioned. She cut me a slice of fresh baked bread and we sat down at her kitchen table and we talked for a few hours. She had so many interesting stories, but more so she seemed interested in everything that I had to say. She asked me so many questions about my life and school and friends and my father's farming that I wound up losing track of time. I told her I had to leave and she asked me if I'd do her one favor 
and fetch her a pail of water from outside the well before I left. I asked her if she had running water, and she laughed, telling me that she could never afford to have such pipes run. I thought that strange, but I did as she asked, and I got her the water. I felt sad leaving her like I knew she would be lonely once I was gone, so I told her I'd come back the next day and bring my mom. My mom was a friendly lady who loved to help others out. Maybe she even knew a way to get the old woman some water lines. True to my word, I went home that night and told my mom about the old woman I'd met. She was furious with me for being gone all day, but once I told her where I had been, she was eager to meet the lady and see if she could befriend her or offer any help. When we drove out the next day, though, I couldn't explain what we found. The barn was fallen in on itself. The red paint had long worn off through years of hard weather. The beautiful lush garden was overgrown with ragweed and thistle. The fence posts were rotted and falling over. There wasn't an animal on sight. The house, too, was run down with pieces of the roof long gone and the windows all busted out. The front door was left wide open. We walked in, careful of the rotted floorboards, and there it was. Right in the middle of the kitchen floor was that pail of water I'd hauled in the day before. Of course, there was no sign of the old woman either. I've driven by that house probably a hundred times since, and I've never found the scene that I happened on that first day. There's just no explaining what I saw. I'm a park ranger working in the Grand Canyon National Park. I usually end up on daily patrols and bus kids for drinking near the edge of the canyon. Sometimes I write citations and tickets for camping violations and reports about wildlife issues. Once in a while, we'll have a missing persons case. Lately, these cases have been becoming more and more common. Now, the first few missing campers they broadcast on the news. The first one was a girl last May. She was that hippie free spirit type driving her van all through the states, stopping in all the best campsites and all the best parks all over. She was all by herself and no one even noticed she was gone till they hadn't seen her posts on her Instagram in a few weeks. Her last calls and texts were to her family on the same day that she last posted. Her phone was turned off for good that same day and the geotag pinpointed her in the desert. We sent out a search party, over 100 people canvassing the area. It's pretty tough to survive out in the desert. There's no water, no food, and it's scorching hot during the day and cold at night. We found her van parked and nothing seemed abnormal. She had some almonds soaking in a jar to make almond milk or something. She was planning on coming back to that van. It had been a week, so at that point we assumed that we were looking for a body. We didn't find many signs out there in the desert of her at all. The only thing that we found that could have been hers was a little fanny pack with some granola bars in it. Really, we don't even know if that was hers or not. The canine rescue team seemed to think so. In all, though, it was like she vanished into thin air. Now, a young girl going missing is sad, but it isn't too out of the ordinary. There's bad men out there, and a pretty little thing like that is vulnerable. Plus, there's high rocks and sandstorms and risk of heat exhaustion. If you're traveling without a guide, you're even at bigger risk of trouble. It started to get more odd when more and more people were going missing. A young man from Idaho traveling with his girlfriend went to pee behind a rock near Mather Point and never walked back over. There were tons of tourists and hikers nearby. No one saw anything weird and there weren't any caves or craters around. He just up and vanished. An onlooker had stated they had seen a blue light flash during the situation, but no one else corroborated their story. The news never mentioned this and the papers left it out too. Some people on Facebook suspected the light could have been a rescue flare or a flashlight. I don't think so. The next problem was a family camping out in the trailers. There were a pack of RVers, a husband, a wife, two sons about 10 and 12 years old. They'd set out to hike the North Rim and left around 8 a.m. They'd signed the check-in sheets and denied the opportunity to have a local guide with them. By evening, when they hadn't signed out, we sent out a search party. Helicopters and dog teams and tons of volunteers went over the next few weeks. 
There was nothing coming up. There didn't seem to be any evidence of foul play. There weren't any storms or abnormalities. There weren't any signs of wildlife. No mountain lions anywhere in the area. And they definitely couldn't have taken down a whole family of four. A husband and wife went missing next. There isn't a ton of information about them. But we think the husband was live streaming right as they went missing. The video footage was scrubbed from the internet. But one of their friends described the clip to me as a witness in our investigation. They told me that the video showed them hiking towards the edge of the canyon, where we think is the Bright Angel Trailhead. The wife was walking backwards and laughing, when all of a sudden she disappeared from view. The husband dropped down the phone and gasped, and then a bright blue light overtook the screen. At that point, the video feed ended. We went to check out the site. We didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Of course, we canvassed the area and sent out yet another search crew. But at this point, the entire ranger team were all feeling dejected and like the entire operation was pointless. We'd been staying up long nights on these search teams and hadn't solved a single thing. Well, the story starts to get really interesting when the black van started rolling in. I don't know if they were FBI, CIA, NSA, or NASA or what. Maybe some program we don't even know about yet. But they are definitely interested in whatever is going on around the canyon. They've set up shop in a big lot with a tall barbed wire fence surrounding the area. There's always those black vans going out all hours of the day and night. They drive all through the park. But I'm not sure they always go back in once they've gone out. Well, I've looked over there with my binoculars some nights. Don't judge me. I've started to see those blue lights flash once in a while. Usually it's through the windows of some warehouse. But they sometimes just appear out of nowhere, right out in the middle of the lot. The lights just pop up for an instant and they're gone. Whatever is going on, I don't want any part of it. I hope those folks are the good guys. And maybe they'll be able to figure out what's going on with those missing people lately. I just hope that they're not the ones causing the issue. Hi Donovan, I'm not sure who else to tell my story to. Everyone will say I'm crazy, or that my imagination ran away with me. But it was the most chilling thing that I've ever seen. And it shook my belief system to the core. I can no longer say what's possible or impossible. Everyone knows Savannah is reported to be one of America's most haunted cities. I've visited several times, and even stayed in rooms that were supposed to be hotbeds of supernatural activity. But I never saw anything, not even an orb. Savannah's a great place to visit anyway, so I stopped ghost hunting and booked a weekend trip with my sister just to relax. We weren't planning on doing anything spooky. I don't know if you or anyone else hearing this is familiar with Factors Walk in Savannah. Factors Walk is a multi-level brick and cobblestone area dividing two streets along the Savannah River. It kind of looks like a back alley behind the waterfront restaurants, but it's a very interesting historical area. Reportedly, there are tunnel systems running all under Savannah for a whole host of reasons. The tunnels that are now sealed over at Factors Walk were used mostly for transporting slaves unloading from the ships in secret, away from prying eyes. There are also tunnels under certain restaurants that claim they were used by nefarious sea captains to Shanghai unsuspecting tavern patrons, forcing them into service at sea. So Factors Walk area, like most of Savannah, is supposed to be haunted. But I'm not done with ghost chasing. So after my sister and I had purchased refreshments from a local cafe, I decided to sit and people watch on a nearby bench while investigating the Klusky Vaults. The Klusky Vaults were built in 1840 and are open to the public to explore. Some people speculate they were once passageways that connected the Klusky Vaults to the rest of the tunnel network. Today, the vaults look like underground storage units, just big, dark rooms built with brick and stone set in the side of an embankment. My sister walked inside the first one, and I let my gaze wander, thinking about where we should eat dinner. After a few minutes, I looked up and I didn't see her. You can't see all the way inside the vaults from where I was sitting, so I wasn't concerned. Until a few minutes later, 
when she hadn't reappeared. I watched for a few minutes more, staring at the four different entrances. Unsure if she had merged and popped out into a different vault to explore, I started to become concerned and stood up, intending to find her. I took a few steps forward and called her name. Suddenly she appeared, standing in the doorway of the same vault I had seen her enter. I walked in her direction and she was staring at me with this bright smile on her face. But her face looked weird, shiny, almost plastic. I was about 25 feet away at the time. She didn't look quite like herself, but it was hard to say what was off. Maybe her eyes, sharp and glittering. They looked a little unmatched, like maybe they were set at slightly different heights from each other. Her grin looked lopsided and fake, and stuck in the same expression. There was something not quite right about her, and she didn't speak, she just stared at me with that weird, unchanging grin. Lynn? I walked closer, frowning. Are you okay? I had gotten about 15 feet away when she abruptly turned and walked back into the vault. I thought maybe it was some kind of joke, like she knew I wasn't into the spooky stuff anymore, and she was planning on popping out and scaring me when I followed her inside. You know, just for laughs. So I stopped right where I was, and I called her name. Lynn! I know I sounded impatient. Then I heard it, my sister's voice calling to me. Not from inside the vault, but from behind me. I whirled around and there was Lynn, frowning as she walked towards me. What's going on? she asked. She still had the coffee cup from Cafe M in her hand. I stared at her, totally uncomprehending. Where were you? I asked. The hairs on my arms started to rise, and I felt goosebumps. She pointed to the row of vaults to our right. I checked them all out. I just came out of the last one, and you were standing there calling my name. What's going on? My knees felt weak. What had I seen? It looked like Lynn. No, correction. It looked like something that was trying to look like Lynn, but not quite succeeding. I must have gone pale, because Lynn grabbed my arm and steered me back over to the bench. I kept my eyes fixed on that first vault while I told her what had happened, but nothing ever emerged. She told me then the first vault had felt really uncomfortable to her, and she'd spent less than a minute inside. It felt so claustrophobic and depressing. There was this sense of dark energy in there with me, she said. We both just stared at that first vault, wondering what it had been. What sort of creature could take on the appearance of my sister? Anne stepped forth into the sunlight. Had it tried to lure me in there? For what purpose? Do you want to go in there and look? Lynn asked me. She sounded scared too. I shook my head, most definitely not. Whatever was in there, trying to escape from that vault on Factor's Walk, was not something I ever wish to encounter again. The craziest thing happened to me a couple of years ago, when my friends and I rented this cabin in the middle of the woods for a couple of nights. We were celebrating a friend's birthday, so we all pitched in and split the cost of an Airbnb. This place was gorgeous, with amazing views all around. There were mountain views as far as the eye could see, and a beautiful creek running right through the property. There was nobody around, just wildlife and beautiful nature. That night we had a nice fire going, and we were just relaxing and laughing. We heard this strange echoing laughter coming from the woods. We all just froze and stayed quiet, listening to hear it again. A while passed and we just kind of brushed it off. Then about a half hour later, we hear the sound again. Creepy, haunting laughter. We decided to investigate. We grabbed some flashlights and headed into the forest. We entered the woods and started looking around with our flashlights. We didn't see or hear anything, so we went deeper into the forest. We stopped again and just listened for a while, but we didn't hear any noise. We were about to head back when a beautiful blonde woman in a long flowered dress walked over to us. She asked who we were, and we told her that we were renting the cabin nearby and heard a strange sound in the woods. She asked what sound we heard and we told her it was a strange, creepy laugh. The woman told us that she hadn't laughed since her beloved husband was brutally stabbed to death in the middle of the night. None of us knew what to say. I just said, sorry for your loss. 
She thanked me and invited us to come over to her home and further investigate the strange sound. We agreed and followed her through the woods into her home. We arrived at this pretty little cottage with a garden in the front, and she said that was her house, and she brought us in. We sat down in the living room, and she started making us some tea. She asked us how long we had been searching for the source of the sound, and we told her a little over an hour. She said that other people that have rented that Airbnb have claimed to have heard strange sounds coming from the forest. But to her knowledge, nobody ever found anything. I asked her what kind of sounds people heard. She said that people have heard screams, cries, and strange animal sounds, but never laughter. When we asked her if she had ever heard anything, she said there are all kinds of wicked things around here. I asked her why she didn't move. She said that her husband had built the house, and all of her fondest memories were in this house. We sat in the living room talking about all kinds of crazy things until very late. We were all exhausted and figured it was time to head back to the cabin and call it a night. Shortly after we left, we hear the laughter again, this time very loudly. It was as if the laughter was coming from the blonde woman's house. When we looked back, we saw a woman peering through her window at us. It wasn't the same woman. She had gray skin and black hair and black eyes and an evil, nasty grin. We ran back to the cabin as quickly as we could, and we kept hearing the laughter trail off behind us. We immediately packed up and drove down the road. We stopped at a motel that we passed and spent the night there. The next morning, we got breakfast at a local diner, and we started talking about what had happened. We looked at the reviews on the Airbnb, and several people claimed the house was haunted. Multiple people claimed they heard creepy sounds coming from the forest. A couple even mentioned the blonde woman and how nice and how hospitable she was. One review said evil lurks there and never go there. Another review said a horrible witch demon. My friend had booked a cabin. I have no idea why he didn't read the reviews. This was too much. Multiple people had similar experiences that we just had, and we got to read them all freshly afterwards. There was no denying that the experience we had was unexplainable but it was relieving to hear that we weren't the only victims. Now when I rent an Airbnb, I make sure I read all of the reviews thoroughly. That is an experience that I never want to have again. I grew up in a suburb that was between New York and Philadelphia. It was pretty rural when I was a kid. My development was surrounded by farms. By the time I got to high school, more houses were being built as people moved away from the big cities for a lower cost of living. Things really started to change when online shopping took off. All the cheap farmland within a two-hour drive of New York and Philly was bought up by corporations and turned into shipping hubs, warehouses, and Amazon fulfillment centers. The whole thing really divided people. Most agreed that the prefab metal warehouses were an eyesore, but others argued that they brought in a lot of jobs and helped the local economy. Traffic got worse. The open fields and trees disappeared. It was all kind of sad, really, but it did help the economy, so I guess I shouldn't complain too much. I moved back in with my parents during the pandemic. I work a remote marketing job, so it was a pretty easy move. I wanted to get out of Philly for the shutdowns. While I was home, I really saw how much the landscape had changed. I noted all the new warehouses and storage facilities, but there was one in particular that caught my eye. My dad likes to hunt pheasants and rough grouse, so we always had bird dogs growing up. English setters, Brittany Spaniels, and the German short-haired pointers to be specific. Anyone who grew up with working dog breeds know they're high energy and they require a lot of exercise. As the remote worker in the house, it fell on me to walk the dog every day. These aren't normal leash walks around the block. We always let our dog run free through the fields in the thickets for an hour or two. Unfortunately, there was only one or two fields left for him to run in. It was also on these walks that I noticed something strange about one of the new warehouses built just outside my parents' development. For starters, it was separated from any other buildings at the far end of the field, with a long driveway connecting it to the road. The driveway looped around to the back of the building, where there was a loading dock that was shielded from prying eyes by a thick patch of woods behind it. All of the other warehouses in the area were built in clusters to reduce cost, 
and allowed them to share the common roadways and loading docks for the trucks. But this isolated warehouse looked like it was purposely built to be inconvenient. I didn't think too much of the isolated warehouse at first, but, but as I noticed more weird details about it on my walks, I started to suspect that something was going on in there. There were no windows and only one entrance on the back of the building. The door had large concrete block in front of it with a narrow slit. It looked like something an archer would hide behind in a castle in Game of Thrones. There was no fence around the structure, but while my dog was roaming the field, I noticed poles stuck in the ground with these dome-shaped cameras on top. I could hear the mechanical motors whining as the cameras panned inside their cases to watch me. I never saw a no trespassing or private property sign, so I continued to let my dog run around the property on her morning walks. The fourth or fifth time I was walking in the field, something glinting in the sun on top of the building caught my eye. When I got closer, I saw the glint was from the glass of a spotting scope. Two men were on the roof watching me. This is the first time I was spooked by the whole situation. If it was a singular guy with binoculars, it would be one thing. But the spotting scope and the second guy made me think of those military movies where the sniper teams had one guy spotting while the other guy was shooting. I cut the walk short and went home. I didn't go back there for a few weeks. The more I thought about the incident, the more I convinced myself that I was being ridiculous. No warehouse in the suburbs would have a sniper team on the roof. I was just letting my imagination go wild after seeing the cameras. Regular businesses care about corporate espionage, so there's nothing suspicious about having basic security. Plus, it wasn't like I actually saw a gun on the roof. Just two guys watching me. One was some optics. So, I went back to the field because it was the only good place to let my dog off the leash within walking distance of my parents' house. The dog got himself wedged deep into a thicket chasing after squirrels. I could hear him rustling around in the trees, but he wouldn't listen to any of my commands, so I trudged in there after him. I came out on the other side of the trees, at the back of the warehouse where the loading dock and entrance were. Standing at the edge of the thicket, was an angry-looking man holding my dog by the collar. I approached him slowly and tried to force a smile. As I approached, I saw the man subtly place his hand on his hip. It was then I noticed he was wearing jeans and a dark jacket. This was a few months into the pandemic, in June or July. It was way too hot to be wearing long pants and a jacket. This was a huge red flag for me, but I needed to get my dog. You can't be here, he said. Sorry, there wasn't any signs. I've always walked my dog here, I replied. He clenched his jaw and just pushed my dog towards me. That's when I noticed a line of vehicles coming up the driveway. They looked like they were driving in a formation. An 18-wheeler was being escorted by two black SUVs in front and two behind. The man stepped in front of me to block my view. He laid a hand on my chest, his other hand still hovering over the jacket pocket and told me I had to leave the property right now. I don't know what's going on in that warehouse, but I'm convinced that it's either a government site or some large, powerful corporation that wants to keep it hidden from the public eye. Either way, I don't go back there anymore. Hello there, Donovan. I'm a retired police officer. And some of the stories I could tell you would make everybody respect us and what we go through daily so much more. It was truly a thankless job. Nobody likes a police officer. But you need one when you need one. I will admit there were bad apples in our department. But most of my fellow officers get into their careers to help people and to protect their community. I've had some unbelievable experiences. But I've only had one true paranormal experience that made me a believer. There are things that can't be explained. There's no such thing as coincidences. And we don't understand everything that's going on in this world. One night I received a call about an elderly woman hearing someone trying to break into her house through her attic. I put my lights and siren on and headed there as fast as I could. When I got there, she frantically swung open the door and screamed, Thank God you showed up. Thank God you came. I ran over to her and asked her where the burglar was coming from. She showed me the attic door and I crawled up to see what was going on. 
I searched that entire attic and didn't find anything out of the ordinary. There were boxes piled up and some pieces of furniture, but not a person trying to break into her house. There were no signs of human entry, and the window up there was locked, so I climbed back down the ladder. I told the woman she should get an exterminator, because if she heard something, it was more likely an animal. There was no way anybody was up there. She insisted that it was a person trying to get in, and even claimed that it was talking to her saying things like, I'm going to get you, and let me out. Just to give her some peace of mind, I went up there and looked around for a while. I checked every square inch of that attic, and even opened boxes and looked inside. It's amazing what junk people save. I crawled back down the ladder and assured her that she is perfectly safe and that I didn't find a single living thing up there. She started crying and pleading with me and said that whatever was up there was trying to get her in the night. I suggested that she stay with a friend or family member and I told her I'd respond to another call. The woman kept calling 911 repeatedly that night and continued doing so every day after that. I would go by and check on her once a day and she would be hysterical every time I saw her telling me some of the things that the person up there threatened to do to her. The threat she would describe kept getting more and more gruesome, and she didn't seem like the type of person to use that type of vocabulary. But I kept going up into the attic to appease her and finding absolutely nothing. Weeks passed, and this became a regular part of my job. It was starting to wear on me. I explained to her that I could be out helping other people that really needed it, instead of going up in her attic, but she was adamant that something was up there. I'll tell you something, though. I never thought she was doing it for attention. I did figure that she was getting older and more senile and was imagining things, but I believe she was experiencing something awful. I recommended she talk to a psychiatrist and told her to get a paranormal investigator to look into her attic. I didn't believe in any of that stuff, but I was desperate to help her get some relief and I was really getting sick of going over there so needlessly. She agreed to do both, and I went to respond to another call. The next time I saw her, she told me that the paranormal investigators told her it was the most amount of activity they had documented in over five years. This actually freaked me out, and I went back up into the attic again. I felt something sinister in that attic, but I kept telling myself that it was just my imagination reacting to whatever she had told me. Loudly enough for the lady to hear, I kept repeating, if you're not here for her greatest good, leave now and forever. And the power of Christ compels you. Both of these I have heard in movies about exorcisms and was mainly just doing so so she would believe me that the spirits were gone. I left after a while and she thanked me over and over again on my way out. That night, she was brutally murdered in her sleep. To this day, it's the most horrific crime that I've ever witnessed. She was stabbed multiple times over her entire body. Her face was unrecognizable, and some of her organs were pulled out of her. And many other details that I just won't share. I get nauseous even thinking about it. Forensics couldn't find a single piece of evidence, and the lady was beloved in the community. We couldn't figure out a single person that would want to do this to her, and our community is still devastated by this tragedy. One thing that still actively haunts me is that the attic door was wide open on the night she was murdered. I know I closed it after I left that night. It could just be coincidence. That's what I've told myself multiple times. But it's the worst thing that I've ever seen. And I don't know how any person could have done something like this. I never talked to anyone who had anything bad to say about her. The feeling in that attic that night, along with the paranormal investigator's claims was enough for me to be more of a believer. The brutality of the murder and the attic being open made me completely trust the poor lady's story, and I do believe that the paranormal entity that kept threatening her finally followed through with its promises. I wanted to tell you a frightening experience I had in June. I was so rattled by this encounter that I've actually put my log cabin up for sale. There's no way I'll ever feel safe again there. I've always loved vacationing in Maine. So much of the state is undeveloped. Over the years, I've seen badgers, coyotes, bear, deer, and moose, but I've never been in fear for my life until this past summer. 
My vacation cabin is located in Azacoast Lake in Maine. I go there by myself to relax at least three times a year. During the winter, it's difficult, as you need to drive nine miles through rough logging roads, which are unplowed in the winter. I've skied in over the lake a time or two, but it's pretty exhausting. These days, I tend to just go when I can drive all the way in. I went up there in June and had a pleasant week, bird watching, hiking, listening to the loons cry on the lake. Toward the end of my stay, I decided to hike the trail that led to an overlook of the Androscoggin Valley. It was deemed difficult by the hiking book I have, but I was wanting a new experience. I got a new experience all right. The trail was a bit tougher than I had realized, overgrown with brambles and fallen trees blocking the way. The amount of debris overtaking the trail made me think no one had used it for a very long time. I got to the first stream crossing and caught a glimpse of a fawn in a doe, which cheered me and renewed my enthusiasm. I filled my water bottle and continued on, knowing I wouldn't find any more water at the top of the mountain. The last leg of the trail involves steep rock faces, but according to the guidebook, you didn't need climbing equipment. There were enough toeholds and footholds that a relatively athletic person could navigate the boulders. I passed a few flat, large rocks that looked to be a prime place to eat lunch on the way down, and filed them away for future reference. By the time I reached the top, I was sweating pretty good. I felt victorious, up there above the tree line looking down at the Androscoggin Valley. The breeze felt good cooling me down, but an unpleasant odor was carried on the wind. It smelled like death. I looked around to find the source and spotted a bit of fur visible within the tangle of the undergrowth. I walked over to look and was surprised at what I saw. It was the remains of a deer. Its head was intact, but its eyes were still wide open in fright. The legs and hooves were still recognizable, but my stomach turned as I viewed the rest. Its entire torso had been ripped apart. All that was left was a hollow rib cage. I felt queasy looking down at it and backed away quickly. It ruined my enjoyment of the overlook, so I decided to get away from the smell and climb back down to the flat rocks. At that point, lunch was the furthest thing from my mind, but I thought it would be nice just to sit there and relax. Within 10 minutes, I had descended to the rock field and chose a nice flat rock. I sat cross-legged and turned my face up to the sun, trying to savor the last bit of vacation I had. Suddenly, I heard a crashing in the bushes above me. I was startled because it sounded like something very large. I turned my head to see, scanning the bushes, hoping it wasn't a bear. As soon as I started looking around, the noises stopped. It was eerily silent. No birds and even the wind had calmed down. I tried to relax, trying to get back into my zen state, but I felt anxious. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. I decided to head back. It would take about a half hour, I guessed, as it took an hour to climb up. I stood and scanned the trail above me once more, but nothing moved. So I started my descent. Every couple of minutes, I would hear a twig snap or leaves rustle. I would stop and wait, holding my breath, listening, and be greeted by silence. As soon as I began to move again, so would the noises. I finally stopped and called out, Hello? My voice sounded pitifully anxious. I waited, but there was no reply. I knew I wasn't imagining it. Something was following me. My heart started beating really fast, and I had the urge to run. I tried to calm myself down, but all I could think was, if it wasn't a person following me, then it was some sort of animal predator. I was so glad to see the cabin 50 yards ahead of me that I broke into a dead run. Immediately, I heard a snarling sound behind me, and my throat closed with fear. I knew instinctively that the animal that had been stalking me was now rushing to attack. I dropped my pack and raced to the door, getting inside and sliding the bolt. I ran to the window to look out, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I've never seen anything like it. My heart started pounding so hard I felt like my head would explode. The creature was frightening large, about seven or eight feet tall, and it looked like a werewolf. I know that's ridiculous, but it was on two legs, and it had the head and fur of a dog. It was barrel-chested and extremely muscular, with its front limbs hanging low about to its knees. I shrank back from the window, feeling so scared and sick, like I was going to faint. 
I heard the long claws scrape at my wooden door, scratching and growling, and I slid down the wall sitting on the floor praying it couldn't get in. I could hear it moving around the perimeter of the cabin, and a horrible stench like a wet dog began to waft through the cracks in the logs. Suddenly its head appeared in the window, and I got a good look at its face. It looked like a creature from hell. A dog's muzzle, large fangs like a wolf, and these glowing yellow eyes. It was peering in, trying to locate me in my cabin. I stayed still and quiet, frozen with fear, hoping it wasn't smart enough to break the glass. A few minutes passed and it finally moved away. I could hear tearing noises as it found my backpack, and then there was silence. I waited a long time before moving, my legs going numb on the cabin floor. I was afraid to give away my location if it was just faking me out. Even though I was terrified, I made myself slide over to the window and look out. It was gone. My backpack was in shreds. It was almost evening and I was too afraid to walk the short distance to where I was parked. I stayed awake all night with the door bolted, afraid to even go out and use the outhouse. As soon as the full light of dawn broke, I made a run for it, getting into my truck and heading back down the mountain. Doors locked and stopping for no one. I haven't been back. I can't explain what I saw. But it has ruined my little cabin forever. I might buy a different place if this one sells. But it won't be in Maine. Hi Donovan. This happened just last week where I lost my cat. I don't mean that he's lost, but rather I saw him get eaten by this thing in the field behind my yard. Let me back up for a second. The last few weeks I've been noticing some strange noises in my yard in the evening, around dusk time. Like this chirping sound, almost like a bullfrog, but different. Slightly more high-pitched. After hearing this sound, I've seen movement in my backyard around the pond. There's tall grass around the pond because I only mow it every few months. It looked like something was running back and forth from the woods to the pond. But since the grass is so high... I really couldn't make out what it was. Then last week, I'm watching my long-haired cat from my back deck as I'm having a drink on the deck. He goes trotting off towards the woods, and then he sees something he wants to pounce on. I thought it was a mouse or something small because I couldn't see anything from the deck, and he's always bringing up dead mice to the back deck. So he's crouched down, and then he takes off. As soon as he takes off, this lizard-type creature grabs him by the neck and bites him and starts eating him. It was a terrible sight to see. I went into the house to grab my shotgun, and I was going to empty it on this thing, but it was gone by the time I came back. I was only in the house for maybe 10 seconds. So now I lost my cat, and I have this creature behind my house. I called animal control, and they came out, but they couldn't find anything. I'm at a loss of what to do. I've never seen anything like this before. It stood maybe three or four feet tall, and it had these long black claws, but it looked like it only had two or three of them. And it was scaly like a lizard, but it was standing on its two legs, which really was freaky. I don't know if anybody in your audience has ever seen anything like this, but it ate my cat. Hey there, Donovan. I've never seen a ghost or anything like that, but one time I saw an animal that freaked me out. Looking back, this is probably what initially sparked my obsession with all things paranormal. I've told this story to a lot of people, and I've had a few say that I was lying and just making this up. It just goes to show you that people's ignorance knows no bounds. Thanks for providing an ever-growing forum where people can share their experiences and gather insight instead of receiving judgment. My dad owns about 50 acres of land, and over the years, we've made a four-wheeler trail that's nothing short of epic. It's got everything, steep inclines, long winding declines, and a couple of ramps where you can get some serious air, a mud pit, and untamed wilderness as far as the eye can see. I love going there to clear my head. There's nobody else around, and there's something about being alone in nature that calms and centers me. Many years ago, I was four-wheeling on the trail late at night when I smelt something awful. We had some problems with people dumping trash on our property a couple of times, so I figured this is what I was dealing with. 
I went off the trail and headed towards the source of the smell. This was a rancid smell, enough to gag a maggot. My eyes started tearing up the closer I got to it. My four-wheeler's headlights revealed a large animal feasting on a smaller animal up ahead and realized that this might be the source of the smell. If one dead animal smelt this bad, I had to figure out what it was. As I got closer to the creature, I realized that it was huge and looked nothing like I've ever seen before in my life. It was the size of a bear with spikes on its back. It looked like a giant wolf without any hair. Its eyes were gigantic and awful. The creature looked right at me, dropped the carcass and started snarling at me. The sounds this beast made were awful. It sounded like a big rabid dog's growl, but it was human-like and sounded demonic. It made low bellowing sounds and then high-pitched pain groans. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I've never heard an animal sound anything like that. I was terrified and knew I needed to get the hell out of there as fast as I could. I gassed it out of there as fast as that four-wheeler would take me. As I made my way back to the trail, I heard those demonic grunts behind me. I thought I was going to die. I tried to swerve the four-wheeler in an unpredictable pattern as I headed back to the house. Finally, I didn't hear the beast anymore, and I made it safely back to the house. I told my dad what had happened, and he grabbed the shotgun and headed out into the woods. We searched all over but couldn't find the creature. When we got to the location where I first saw the beast, the small animal carcass was still there, but it was nowhere to be found. What was strange was that the little animal was mostly intact, despite the size of the demonic naked wolf that feasted on it. Dad checked all the trail cams, but none of them caught the creature on the camera. He told me to be careful and keep an eye out for it. I began researching what I had seen in the woods, and the only thing that was coming up at first was Bigfoot. But then I learned about a creature called a chupacabra. This creature was described as five to six feet tall, wolf-like in appearance, and it has spikes on its back, and it doesn't have any hair. Chupa means sucker, and cabra means goat in Spanish. It was called goat sucker because it was often found sucking the blood out of animals such as goats. Could this thing in the woods have sucked all this poor animal's blood out? I'm not saying with 100% certainty that the creature that I saw was a chupacabra, but out of all the animals that I've researched, this is the only one that I've found that matches what I saw. I hope I never see it again, but I've looked for it a lot over the years. My dad and I put up more trail cams, and we put motion lights all along the trail to try to get some evidence of this creature. So far, however, we've only captured deer, dogs, and turkeys. But having motion lights so you can ride the trail at night is awesome. So maybe I should be thanking the beast. Thanks for reading my story. I can't believe I'm telling this story. I was eight or nine years old and I was a very quiet kid. It was a good way for me to escape since my mom was such an emotional abuser. During that time, I was really into mystery stories. My dad was frustrated with me because he wanted me to read biographies and stuff like that to improve my mind. I liked those too, but I couldn't get enough of the mysteries. I guess I fancied myself an amateur detective after reading so many. I had changed schools a lot since my dad was always searching for the one that jived with his quirky views. That year, he had enrolled me in a parochial school. We had to wear uniforms every day. It was pretty rigid, but I liked my teachers. Except for Sister Virgilis, our religion teacher. She was ancient. She looked like she was about 100 years old. Nothing against old people. I love old people. She wore the full-length traditional black habit with all the accessories that go along with nun life. She looked so mean and was so strict and grouchy. Probably for a good reason. Since I was so quiet, it wasn't easy for me to make friends. I did have one friend, though. Her name was Brenda and we really bonded over our mutual love for mysteries. The school didn't have a playground, so at recess every day, they would take us across the street to play at this park. The teachers were very lenient when we were outside, and we were allowed to roam all over. At one corner of the park, there was this really old white brick building. Brenda and I were obsessed with this building. All the doors and windows were bricked up, so the whole thing was just a giant white brick structure. 
but you could see the outlines where the doors and the windows had been. Just faint lines. We would spend most of recess going round and round and examining the place. We always hoped we'd be able to find a way in. We got our hopes up for a while, then we discovered some stairs down to an old cellar door. That was the only door not bricked in, but it was nailed shut. The only other access was the old mail slot next to where the entrance door had been. You could still push that mail slot in and look. Why would they leave that unbricked? When we looked through there, all that we could see was a dark cavernous room and a bunch of tables. The place really had a feel of an old asylum, but it was completely unmarked. Brenda and I were convinced beyond a doubt that something was going on in there, mainly because of the clicking sounds. I meant it obviously seemed completely abandoned, but if you listened at the mail slot, there were these intermittent clicking sounds. There was no pattern to the sounds, but we heard them regularly. It was too loud to be an insect, but it sounded like it came from something alive. Well, one night in the fall, the school was having an open house. It was a chance for parents to talk to teachers and for students to show off their work. The whole school was buzzing with all those people making their way through, checking out all of the classrooms. Brenda grabbed my hand and pulled me over to the refreshments table so we could steal some cookies. We weren't supposed to take anything until all the presentations were done. I had just gotten a hold of a cookie bar when an old hand came on top of mine. I looked up and saw Sister Virgilis glaring down at me. I snatched my hand away and ran down the hall with Brenda. We burst through the front door and ran across the street to the park. We had never been there before at night. We were standing in the middle of the park and we looked over at that building. The outlines around the windows and doors were glowing. Just hairline cracks of light shaped like windows and doors. It was the most surreal thing ever. We whispered to each other and agreed to quietly approach the building. I can't even believe we went over there. It was like our detective personas kicked in and we weren't even appropriately afraid. As we got closer to the mail slot, we started hearing those clicking sounds again. They were much louder than we ever heard them before. We crouched down slowly and pushed the mail slot and looked in. There were several lanterns around the tables like the kind you would take camping, like Coleman lanterns. There were two unnaturally tall and skinny men standing at one of the tables. They had no clothing and they were incredibly pale. The clicking sounds seemed to be coming from them. They were crouched around something laying under a sheet on the table. We couldn't tell at all what was under that sheet, but it seemed to be pretty much the length of the table, like human size. Then one of the men bent its head down and the clicking got really loud. Suddenly it made some kind of contact with whatever was on the table and there was like a sharp intake of air. It reminded me of a Dementor's kiss or something. You know, like in Harry Potter? The thing under the sheet started struggling and suddenly we realized we should be very afraid. We looked at each other just horrified and ran away from the building as quietly as we could. We ran back into the school and hunkered down by a window, trying to see the building, but it was hidden from our view. Sister Virgilis saw us there and thought we were hiding from her, but she was nothing at all after we had seen that. Hey Donovan, hope you're doing well. You're probably doing better than I am. I was just fired from my job because of something I saw. For several years, I've been working for this company that creates VR and 3D interactive photos for the purposes of construction and selling real estate, logistics, and creating virtual tours for companies. My latest assignment was to do a 3D scan of one floor of an old office building. The client was trying to rent it out. I have to say right off the bat, this place gave me the creeps. I was ready to take the photos and 3D scans of this place and get out of there as quickly as possible. When I took the first scan, I couldn't capture anything in the room because of what appeared like a thick white fog that covered the entire room. I didn't see any fog in there with my eyes, so I figured it had to be smudges on the lenses of the 3D camera. I cleaned the lenses and tried to capture the room again. When I looked at the footage scanned, all that showed up was what looked like a dense fog that filled the room again. I was pretty frustrated and I believed it was a technical malfunction of either the camera 
or our software that was causing me to waste my time in this run-down, creepy building. I moved on to a room on the other side of the building, thinking maybe it was some sort of electromagnetic interference. After doing another scan, I got the same result, and I figured I would try again later with different equipment. I took the 3D camera and my computer back to my work, and had this guy Eric from the IT department look at the files of the scans. He told me that he had never seen anything like this happen before, and it must have been a glitch with the software on my computer. He gave me another camera and computer and I headed back to the old building. As soon as I got back there, I felt uneasy, but I was just ready to complete this job and never come back to that place again. I set up my equipment and took a scan of the main room. When I looked at the footage, it had successfully scanned the entire room, but it looked like there was this red filter on all the footage. It reminded me of those old 007 movies where James Bond shoots the screen and blood drips down over the camera lens. I tried several more times. All of the footage was still red. I called my boss and explained all the technical malfunctions I was having. He told me to take the equipment to IT and just try again tomorrow. The next day I went up to IT and Eric told me that all of the equipment was working perfectly now. Relieved, I made my way back to this building and was ready to get this job behind me. I set everything up and began the scan. I left the room so I wouldn't be in the footage, and after a few moments, I went back in. I checked the footage, and this time on the computer screen, it said there was an error capturing the scan. I tried again, and when I came back in, my computer said the same thing. I called IT, and they told me to restart the computer, unplug the camera, and plug it back in. I did as they instructed, and then I couldn't get my computer to register the camera as being plugged in. IT told me to bring the equipment to them, and they would give me new equipment that they were sure worked perfectly. This entire process was a total pain. I was really frustrated, but I headed back to work. I went to IT, gave the old equipment to Eric, picked up the supposed working equipment, and went back to the building. I did another scan and prayed it would work, and went to check on the footage. This time, I captured the room perfectly except there was a dark figure of what looked like a man's shadow in the corner of the room. I'm not sure what this was, so I set up the equipment to do another scan, ran out of the room, and I made sure I left plenty of time for the camera to scan the entire room. Now keep in mind, I've been doing this for years, and I've never had any problems before. When I got back into the room, the camera was smashed on the ground, and the computer in the scan was incomplete. This camera had a round stand on the bottom, so it was pretty much impossible for it to tip over. Something must have picked it up and hurled it onto the ground. It was also an expensive camera and made of sturdy metal. It wasn't the type of thing to break easily. I freaked out and grabbed everything and ran out of there. I took it to IT and explained what happened. He looked at me like I was crazy, so I begged him to look at my past captures. The fog, the redness the dark figure, and my last attempt for anything out of the ordinary. The computer read that the scan was incomplete, but Eric was able to extract what the camera had captured before it was smashed. There was a gray hand reaching down towards the camera. We both froze and stared at it. I was terrified and asked him to send me the files. I ran to my boss's office and explained to him what had happened. He accused me of lying and fired me on the spot for destroying company property, and for time theft. I begged him to look at the footage and told him I wasn't lying, but he had security escort me out of the building with all my stuff. Later, I called Eric to send me the files, and he told me to meet him for some coffee. At the coffee shop, Eric told me that our boss had all the files erased, and the computer that I captured it on destroyed. I still can't believe this happened to me. Why were there spirits in the building so hostile to me? I don't understand why my boss acted that way he did towards me. Why would he want the evidence destroyed? And why did he fire me so quickly? So many unanswered questions. I'm forced just to move on and get another job. I'm still in shock over everything that happened. Hi Donovan. With so many incredible stories that you tell, I don't know if you'll end up publishing this one or not but I would appreciate your opinion on what I experienced in Missouri a few summers ago. My wife and I were overdue for a vacation. 
and we wanted to get out of the state and forget the world for a while. We ended up renting this amazing cottage on hundreds of acres of land in Missouri. It was gorgeous. There were rolling hills and woods as far as the eye could see, and a beautiful river that ran right through the property. My favorite thing about it all was there was a hot tub covered in lanai, where you could sit and take in the sights. I wanted to check out the whole property one day, so I followed the property line and ended up going pretty deep into the woods. The wildlife around there was incredible, and I even saw black bears and wild boars roaming around carefree. It was nature's beauty at its finest. I would love to know what that property costs. I got out to this one area of the woods where a river ran right through it, and you could follow the river for miles. I did this for a while, and I saw this big majestic bison drinking water right out of the river. I was pissed I didn't have my phone with me to take a picture, but I was determined to get as close as possible. The closer I got to it, however, the less it looked like a bison. It was huge and furry like one, but it had these jagged spikes along its back, like nothing I'd ever seen on an animal before. It also had one giant horn on top of its head like a rhino. It was the strangest looking creature I'd ever seen before. It started freaking me out the closer I got to it, and I decided to keep a healthy distance between it, as I had no idea what it was. It took massive gulps of water at a time. I could hear it from a decent distance away. Suddenly, the beast looked at me, and I was terrified. It had one giant eye, and it screamed at me so loudly, it shook the ground. I immediately took off into the woods. I must have been so scared that I passed out. I woke up later that night in the dark, with no phone and no flashlight, miles away from the cottage. I had no idea where I was, and I didn't know what direction to start walking in. I was really scared, and it crossed my mind that I might die in the middle of the woods that night, with nobody around to find me. I finally found the river, and I figured I would follow the river to keep an eye out for anything that looked familiar. I kept walking and walking alongside the river, and eventually, I smelled the faint smell of a campfire. My wife must have lit one. I kept following the river, and the smell of the campfire got stronger and stronger. Finally, I saw the campfire in the cottage and made my way towards it. By this point, I was beyond exhausted, hungry, and dehydrated. I got close to the campfire, and I must have passed out again. The next thing I know, I wake up in the hospital and my wife is sitting next to my bed. I told my wife about the nasty beast I saw. I talked about the large bison-like body and jagged spikes across its back, the giant horns on its head, and the most unusual part, its big singular eye. My wife told me I was just hallucinating from dehydration, and I just needed to rest. The nurse came in to check on me, and I told her all about this creature I saw. She told me about an urban legend that was unique to Missouri, called the Mini Washitu, which fit the exact physical characteristics that I described. When I looked it up, it said that anybody who saw it became crazy, writhed around in unspeakable pain, and was only relieved from these ailments through inevitable death. Luckily, I never experienced any of those awful things, and I am still very much alive to tell the tale. It has me believing, however that maybe what I saw wasn't a -a one-of-a-kind creature, but more of a common creature that was relatively rare and commonly mistaken as a mythical one. I will say one thing, though. The beast's scream was the worst thing that I'd ever heard to this day. The scream was not an ordinary roar of an animal. It shook me and everything around it, and it made me immediately fear for my safety and for my life. Everyone I tell this story to stops believing me the minute I mentioned it had one eye. But that's the part that's burnt into my memory. What a hideous creature I saw that day. I'll never forget seeing it and I hope I never see it or anything like it again. Let me know if you have any insight on what this creature could have been. Hey Donovan, I've got a story to tell you. I'm still processing it. In all honesty, my therapist says it's better to talk about it then they keep it all bottled up inside. So I'll start off with a bit about me. My name's Sam and I'm in junior college at the University of Maine. I'm studying environmental science and engineering. I'm a big hiker and I love to get outdoors in any capacity, running, skiing, tubing, fishing, whatever it is. 
they're all just peaceful activities. And my therapist says it's good for me because it gives me some time away from my anxiety in peace and quiet. I even got into bird watching. I'm not too skilled at bird watching, but I've gotten better this last semester because I took a class on ornithology. There are a few main points to birding that I learned. You always need a good pair of binoculars, and a field guide can be your best friend. But your ears can be your most useful tool. Birds make all kinds of different calls depending on what they're trying to communicate. They might call for a mate, or that they spotted food, or as a warning, or to communicate directions or to signal danger. Some birds have lots of different calls and sounds and songs, and they usually have a variety of different pitches and vocalizations along with them. I've memorized most of the common sounds here in the Northeast, and you can do a pretty good job matching them up with the correct bird. I've also been out hiking enough to recognize the look of most, depending on if they're a male or female, or a fledging, or an adult, or a senior. That's a lot to learn, and I've been determined to learn it all. I've been going out almost every morning on the weekends to see what I can find. Early morning is usually the best time for birding, because it's not too hot for them and some of their predators aren't up yet, or have just gone to bed. You know what they say, the early bird gets the worm. I had been hiking for about a mile at Moose Point State Park, and I had seen a lot of different birds. I started to hike up a hill to get a better viewpoint, and maybe catch some overstory birds flying by. I found a path that winded up the mountain and took me to this perfect aerial viewing in a clearing. I sat down and took a breather, it wasn't long before I felt a shadow fly over me. I looked up as quickly as I could, but I didn't see anything in the sky. Then I heard some rustling in the trees. I pulled out my binoculars and tried to get a better look. All I could see is this black wing popping in and out of a massive pine tree. The entire trunk was swaying back and forth as needles and branches flew out in all directions. All of a sudden, this creature popped out of the tree line. I thought it could have been a vulture or a raptor or an eagle, but the wings were far too large, and its face wasn't like a bird at all. In fact, the most shocking thing was it didn't really have a face at all, only these bright red eyes that were tracking something down below. It had the body of a person almost, but it was covered in this thin layer of black fuzz. Its wings were huge and spread out almost two yards wide. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It started to dart down below the trees, and I stood up with my binoculars to follow it. For a while, the whole forest was silent, and then I heard this deer crying in pain. The leaves on another tree shook, and then out of the clearing below, this creature came flying by with a doe stuck between its talons. It was a bit off kilter from carrying its weight, but it flapped its huge wings smoothly nonetheless. I followed the beast with my binoculars for as long as I could, but eventually it was out of my sight for good. I sat there in shock for a while and then made my way down the hill to get out of that forest. As I approached the area where the deer got scooped up from, I saw a mess of fallen trees, broken branches, and leaves strewn all about. Certainly a struggle had taken place. I got out of there as quickly as I could and spent the rest of the day googling what I had seen. Although it seems unlikely to have been this far north, I do believe I saw what you call a mothman. It certainly was not a normal bird or a bat. If this thing was able to pick up an adult deer, would it be able to pick up me too? I have a very special episode for you today with actual video footage of what appears to be a portal opening up in Victoria's backyard. I received this footage via email. The footage you see now was taken from one of her eight security cameras that she installed in her backyard due to all of the strange things that were happening. First, let's back up a minute and let me read the email from Victoria. Hi, Dred. This portal popped up twice in our backyard one night. The house was in Noonan, Georgia. The place was just weird. My son was terrified of the house and would sleep downstairs on the couch until we moved out of there in 2019. My niece said she sees a man with red eyes there. My husband and I fought constantly, and that's not normally a thing that we do. I'm attaching two videos and a picture of a pair of his eyeglasses 
that disappeared one day, only to pop up two years later in the backyard. Whatever it was, was intelligent, and hid very well, because we never saw it. We could hear something, but never see anything. I always heard a baby crying in what sounded like a ballroom with a bunch of people talking and glasses clinking. It's crazy, I know. We moved out of there and have never seen or heard anything again. Thank you, Victoria. P.S. Turn down the volume when watching the video footage. Now there seems to be several things going on here. 1. The place appears to be haunted. She mentions her husband's glasses that were taken from inside the house and appear two years later in her backyard. Here are the pictures that Victoria sent me of the glasses. She also hears what sounds like a baby crying. And she also hears what sounds like a ballroom of people talking and glasses clinking, like some type of get-together is going on at the house. What exactly happened at this house? Where these spirits are hanging around and won't leave? Are they responsible for what we're about to see? I have to say this is a pretty amazing video. I'm going to fast forward to the part right before this portal, or what appears to be a portal, opens up. Then we will take another look at it and analyze it a little further. Now let's look at this slowed down to 25%. You will see there is a small ball of white just prior to this thing opening up. You can tell that there are traces of bugs flying around, but what appears to be this ball does not seem like a bug. The light from this supposed portal gets brighter as you can see, and there is nothing behind it that you can see from this video. Victoria mentioned that she had eight cameras at the time, but she wasn't able to back up all the video from the cameras. So this is the only camera that we have video footage from. You can see the shadows from the deck post from the light. To have this bright of a light source emanating at this angle, you would definitely see the source of the light prior to this happening. I don't see any evidence of that. It doesn't appear that there's a spotlight or anything that is behind it. Do I think this is a portal of some kind? Maybe. It might just be. I can't explain how this light appears. And in this shape. It's like a doorway. Possibly a doorway to another dimension. Now I'm going to let the video play, and you can hear Victoria's family's reaction to what appears to be a portal or at the very least, some type of light energy source. What is it, Molly? Look, I'm, no, I'm, I'm there's gonna, look, nothing look, there. I'm going to walk up there. I'm going to walk right towards that. There's nothing there. Now, look, look, hey, wait, don't leave it. Stay right here. Jordan. You stay here in the corner. You keep it, keep, keep it, is it on? Stay, keep it on the camera. She's going to stand right here in the corner. I'm going to walk up towards it. There's nothing there. I know, but I want you to see if you see me coming into that. I'm scared, man. That's where the fuck the kids jump on the trail. No, I did. I got a little weird feeling all of a sudden. Usually, I'm not scared of shit. Some of them. I just had a chill grab in my body. Now, if you think that is crazy, then watch this clip of them walking behind this energy source. If there was a spotlight or some type of light source causing this, there would be a shadow when they walk behind it. You can clearly see that the light source is coming from this portal-shaped object and glowing outwards because you can see the shadows of the beams of the deck. If someone would walk behind that light source and there are no shadows, that means what you see is the actual light source. I have to say this is a very interesting video. If you want to watch this video in its entirety, check out the link below. It's hosted on dreadsarmy.com. Now we are going to hear a few more strange and weird encounters. Hi Donovan, my name is Charlie and I'm 66 years old and I've been a truck driver for 43 years. My wife of 45 years, Ellen, has been trying to convince me to retire since I turned 60. 
but I wanted to get a few more years in before settling down to a solitary lifestyle. This last trip to Utah, though, has done me in. I was heading down I-15 through Salt Lake Valley, and it was getting pretty late. I could feel myself close to dozing off, so I decided to find a place to park and bed down for the night. Typically, I try to find a well-lit truck stop parking lot to bed down in, especially since I'm getting up in my years and not as able to fight for myself as I was in my prime. That night, though, I thought I would find a quiet rest stop somewhere between towns. There are few things in this world more beautiful than an unobstructed Utah night sky, and I wanted to be able to stargaze a little before I fell asleep. I was able to find a good place to stop, then suddenly I remembered I hadn't eaten in a while. I pulled a half a leftover sub sandwich and a soda out of my cooler. I know, dinner of champions. And I decided to get something in my stomach before I laid down. Since it was a clear night, I left the truck to stretch my legs out. And I found a picnic table to sit at while I ate and watched the stars. I figured there must have been a heavy rain earlier in that day. The whole place smelled muddy and wet. Although the picnic table was bone dry. In hindsight, I guess that was pretty strange, but it didn't really faze me at the time. As I was eating my sandwich, I looked up and noticed what appeared to be five lights in a row traveling together through the sky. I figured it must have been an aircraft of some kind, but I'd never seen one quite like it before. I sat watching the aircraft move through the sky for a moment. Then something truly bizarre started to happen. The lights began to separate, spinning around each other in a circular motion as one moved towards the center of the circle and changed to a deep teal blue color. Then all at once, every light around me went out. When I say every light, I mean every light. The security lamps in the parking lot, the parking lights on my truck, even the stars. I was sitting in complete and total darkness. Have you ever heard a voice in your head? Like when you're remembering something someone told you, or even talking to yourself. You know that inner voice that narrates our everyday thoughts. I've heard that some people don't hear that at all, but I think the majority of us know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, that voice in my head was suddenly hijacked by someone else. All at once, I heard my own voice in my mind saying, Charlie, don't be afraid. This won't take long. Of course, my initial response was to feel a bit of panic. I started to stand up and to run back to my truck, and that's when I first realized that I couldn't move. Be calm, Charlie, the voice said again, and then it was as if I was being injected with some kind of drug. My whole being just relaxed. I felt like I was floating on a cloud. I'm not sure how much time passed like that. It didn't feel like long, but out of nowhere, I was staring into a bright white light and heard what sounded like whispering all around me. It wasn't at all unnerving. I felt almost like being surrounded by my loving family. There's no other way to describe the warmth and the comfort I felt in that moment. When I should have been petrified out of my gourd, I was soaking up the moment and hoping it would never end. All at once, though, the light released me and I found myself alone sitting at the picnic table, sandwich still in hand, looking up at the sky. It was as if all the time had simply been erased and I was right back in the very position I started in. Only now, I couldn't smell the mud. I made my way back to the truck and decided I had enough of the great wide open. I was going to drive myself to the next town and camp out in a better lit truck stop parking lot. As I drove, though, I noticed that red light zipping towards me from the sky. At first, it seemed to be standing still. Then it seemed to grow, and I realized it was actually coming closer. I wondered if it was intent on colliding with me, so I took the next exit off the interstate and changed course. I'd have to backtrack in the morning, I figured, but it would be worth it not to get hit by that thing. When I finally found the truck stop and parked, I didn't expect to fall asleep as quickly as I did, but it was as if somebody put me under anesthesia as soon as my head hit the pillow. I dreamed all night about short, skinny gray people with large, bulbous black eyes. They had no mouth or nostrils, but they were standing all around me in a circle as I sat frozen on that picnic table, and they were whispering. When I woke up the next morning, I was a little taken back. I don't know what those dreams were about or what happened to me. One thing is for sure, though, 
I don't want to drive through Utah again, and I think it's time to finally retire. I live in New Orleans. The place is full of ghost stories. We've got the voodoo queen, ghost tours, haunted cemeteries, all of it. So you kind of get used to it, really. I never really took it seriously. Most of it's for show, for the tourists. I figured as a local I was above all that. I knew what to believe and what not to. Not like the rubes walking around with a hurricane in a go-cup gawking at cemeteries. That was before I turned 18 and graduated from high school and got my own apartment in the French Quarter. I work in a museum in the Quarter, so I wanted to live there to be close to my job, but I wasn't sure I'd be able to afford it. The Quarter is loud, but it has a certain charm and if you work in the area, and it's much easier to get to your job if you don't have to commute and then try to park there. I figured it was worth a try though, and I got online to look. When I saw the rent on this apartment in Decatur, I thought maybe it was a typo, because it was so low. I had nothing to lose, so I called. The landlord seemed weirdly happy that I called, so I thought the place must be a total dump. I agreed to meet him at the apartment the next day. He also seemed concerned that we looked at the apartment before it got dark. After work, the next day, I walked over there. Decatur is a street full of tourist shops and restaurants and bars. The apartment was above a bar. I don't want to say the name, but it's kind of a local hangout. The type of place that serves free gumbo to get people to buy more beer and has bathroom with graffiti on the walls. You had to walk up some stairs in the back of the bar to get up to it. Once you were up there, though, it was nice. Tall ceilings, wood floors, just one bedroom and one bath, and an old stove in the kitchen. The window looked out onto a nice courtyard with a plant and a little fountain. The landlord couldn't take my deposit check quite quick enough. I wondered if he had a gambling problem or something, because he seemed to need that money pretty bad. I moved in a few days later and everything was fine. It's an old building, like a lot of them in the quarter, so the pipes kind of groaned, and I couldn't use too many appliances at once or the fuse would trip, but that was okay. The first night, though, I had a weird urge to buy vodka. I don't drink vodka, but that gray goose at the corner store called my name. I didn't want to because that stuff's not cheap. But I also wanted to. Had to, really. When I got home, I was going to put it in the cabinet. But something told me to put it in the freezer. Something like almost a voice. Almost, but not enough to scare me. Well, not yet, anyway. Over the next few days, I started noticing an extra glass in the sink in the morning. I don't always do my dishes after dinner, and a lot of times I have friends come over and eat, or just for a drink after work. So I wasn't really sure. Did we use four glasses last night, or three? After a week, I decided to make sure the sink was empty before I went to bed, just to see. Sure enough, in the morning, there was a glass in the sink. I'd forgotten about the vodka. I finally put two and two together and checked the bottle. It was half empty. I started to freak out. Who was breaking in at night and drinking my vodka? Why? I made sure all the doors and the windows were locked, but it still happened. Someone must have a key, I figured. I listened, but I didn't hear anything. Yet the glass kept appearing and the vodka level got lower. I finally set up a camera and pointed it at the fridge. It would have to pick up whoever was coming in. By this point, I was terrified, and my hands were shaking the next morning when I checked the footage. It showed nothing but the glass was still there. I watched it over and over, but I didn't see anything. Finally, I turned up the volume as high as it would go, and I heard something like a voice on the video, but I couldn't understand what it was saying. I thought about calling the landlord, but I didn't want anyone thinking I was crazy. I decided to go to the bar downstairs instead. Bartenders have heard it all, right? I ordered a beer and asked the bartender what he knew about the apartment upstairs. He said he's only been working at the bar for a year, so he doesn't know the whole story, but he heard a guy was found dead up there after Hurricane Katrina. Since then, no one has rented the place for more than a couple of months. Most people just break their lease, leave the deposit, and move out. I asked him what he could tell me about the guy, and he said supposedly he used to drink in this bar. Vodka, I asked. He said, yeah, how'd you know? I said, lucky guess. He said some people say someone murdered the guy 
and others say he just drank himself to death. At that point, I figured I could either move out or see what happened. I mean, there's ghosts in New Orleans, I guess. This one seemed pretty harmless, so I decided to just live with it. So far, so good. I buy the vodka, and I wash the glasses. The ghost, if that's what it is, leaves me alone. I'm a realtor in Willow Springs, Missouri. That's part of the Ozark Mountains, and very near to Mark Twain National Forest. I don't know if that has any bearing on what I saw, mostly because I'm not even sure what it was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's what happened just last June. My office got a phone call from a woman whose grandmother had recently passed on. She had inherited her grandmother's house, which was barely within the town limits of Willow Springs. Even though I'd been living here for 28 years, I'd never been aware of the place. And this is a very small town, with only a couple thousand residents. It was that remote, set at the end of a dirt road that wound through the mountains. The client was living in California, and she told me she wanted to sell the house. But she wouldn't be able to come to Missouri. She said she hadn't been back here in many years, and had no idea what condition the house was in. She did say it was a very old house, built over a hundred years ago, and might need some repairs before it was marketable. Basically, my first step would be to evaluate the property and let her know what I found. The lawyer's office dropped off a key, and I drove out to the house, almost getting lost along the way. It was set way back in the woods, and the driveway was unmarked, not even a mailbox. After passing it once, I backtracked and took a guess, turning down the driveway. It was only when I saw the house number on the front of the door that I knew I had found the place. It was in more of a state of disrepair than I expected. The client had told me her grandmother had lived out the last of her days here, but it looked like it had been abandoned for years. The roof was badly in need of repair, starting to cave in on one section. The paint was peeling and the steps were broken. There was a set of bulkhead doors on the side of the house secured with a rusted chain and padlock. I made a mental note to ask my client for the key. I carefully picked my way through the tall weeds to the steps, watching out for snakes. We have rattlers here, you know, and this looked like the perfect setting for them. I fit the key into the lock and opened the door, not quite knowing what to expect. I actually was pleasantly surprised. Although it smelled a bit musty inside, the interior didn't look too bad at all. You could tell my client's grandmother had cared for her home. There were crocheted doilies on the tables and TV stand, and simple but pretty curtains hung in the windows, probably hand-sewn. The place was clean, no dirty dishes or trash. It was just dusty and needed airing out. I walked around inspecting the condition of the walls and the ceiling, trying to spot any issues that needed repair. Beyond the roof and exterior, it didn't look too bad. In the house, being quite large and set on three acres would no doubt bring in a pretty penny on the market. I figured I'd better take a peek in the basement, even though I was unable to open the bulkhead doors to air it out. A lot of these older homes have dirt basements, but I had come prepared wearing old sneakers. I found the cellar door in the kitchen, painted white with a black cast iron sliding latch on it. I slid the bolt, opened the door, and flipped on the light. The lights didn't work. I flipped the switch on and off again, but the bulb was obviously burnt out. For a minute, I thought of skipping the basement until the next time I came, but I wanted to be able to provide the client with an accurate home value. I went back to the kitchen and rummaged through the drawers. Thankfully, I found a flashlight. I shined the beam down the stairs. Yep, just as I expected, it was a dirt floor. The stairs looked okay, though. I swung the beam around a bit, checking for broken boards. It was then that I noticed something concerning. There were scratch marks on the inside of the door. Claw marks like the kind a dog makes when they want to get in. I examined them in the light. They ran pretty deep. The door would have to be replaced. Filing that information away, I started down the steps, feeling bad for the old woman's dog, apparently locked in the cellar. I was careful going down, not knowing how long it had been since someone had used the stairs. I had to stop several times when I ran into cobwebs to wipe them off my face. I was getting a little creeped out, but then I was finally at the bottom. 
The only windows were tiny rectangular squares set high up. It was pretty damn dark. I tried to focus on looking for foundation issues, but I was starting to feel uneasy. You know how if you have your eyes closed, sometimes you can tell when somebody comes into a room, even if you don't hear their footsteps. Something about the way the air shifts, like the space you're in seems smaller when you share the room with someone else. Maybe that sounds crazy, but as I moved further into the dark basement, shining my beam on those stone walls and dirt floor, I had a terrible certainty that something was down there with me. My heart started to pound and I started to panic, swinging my flashlight beam around erratically, trying to see what it was. I knew something was there. And then I saw it. It was crouched up on the rafters, a dark shape as big as a man. My flashlight beam caught the yellow reflection of its eyes. And then I saw a flash of teeth. I said, holy crap, and I stumbled back a step but I was afraid to turn my back on it. It seemed to know that I had seen it. It shifted position, and I suddenly saw wings. Great, terrible, dark wings, unfolding from its body like it was preparing to come after me. I screamed and ran for the stairs. Unfortunately, I stumbled and dropped my light, but I was too afraid to go back for it. Thank God I didn't fall. I just careened on through the dark until I hit the staircase, and then scrambled up as fast as I could. I heard a noise behind me, and I was absolutely terrified knowing this thing was gaining on me. I took those stairs two at a time, praying I didn't trip again, and by the grace of God, I made it to the top before it caught me. I barreled through the door and slammed it, bolting the latch and leaning back against it, trying to catch my breath, and that's when I heard it, scratching down low on the door, just like a dog that wants to be let out. I ran from the house without even locking it behind me. I jumped in my truck and took off. I drove like a madman out of the woods, wanting nothing more than to reach town. Whatever that creature was, I never wanted to see it again. I didn't take on the account. I called the client's lawyer and said I'd gone out there and the front door was wide open. So I decided not to go in in case there were vagrants inside. Then I told him after seeing how far out of town the property was, I had decided it wasn't a good fit for me. I mailed him back the key. The image of the property still haunts me. And sometimes I wonder, is that why the bulkhead doors were padlocked shut? As a police officer, I can tell you we get called out on some strange stuff. But when something really unexplainable happens, it usually gets brushed under the rug. The higher-ups don't want us to get a reputation for being wackos. And I mean, I can understand that. But if more people were allowed to tell their stories, then all of this stuff could become less taboo. Anyway, it's nice to be able to tell a story about this here anonymously. I know that most of your listeners are less judgmental of the unknown. I've been on the force in one of the Salt Lake City suburbs for about 12 years. When this happened, me and my partner were working the night shift. We were called to investigate a suspected break-in at a morgue. When we arrived, the custodian was waiting for us out front. He told us that he had been mopping one of the corridors, and he had seen something move in his peripheral vision. He said he looked up and saw a person sprint from one side of the hallway to the other. He wasn't able to give much of a description, though. He said that he hadn't seen the person very clearly since they had flashed by so fast. It was just a dim outline, but it was enough for him to be sure that someone was in there. He had gotten freaked out and went outside to make the call to the station. My partner and I went into the building. We called out to anyone who might be inside, but we got no answer. So we began to do a sweep. We walked down the central corridor with our hands on our guns. We were going slow. We had to check every room on each side of the hallway. It was creeping me out a little bit, to be honest. I mean, I've been around plenty of dead bodies and stuff, but I didn't know what kind of individual we were chasing. Who breaks into a morgue? Every now and then we would call out for an intruder to show themselves. We were about halfway down the corridor when I got to a room with the light off. It was pitch black inside. I flipped the switch expecting to find the intruder hiding, but it was just the waiting room for visiting relatives. Then I heard my partner call out, Hey, stop, turn around. I got a big surge of adrenaline and swung back out into the corridor. I saw that my partner was pointing his gun towards something at the end of the hallway. 
He said, she went around that corner. The custodian was back by the door. When he realized which way she had gone, he yelled out, she's trapped. There aren't any exits that way. We were concerned that with the person being trapped, they might do something crazy. We had the custodian lock himself in the waiting room for safety. Then we started advancing down that hallway. We kept calling out to the woman to show herself. We made it clear that we weren't there to hurt her. I made it to the end of the hallway first. I had my back against the wall and I looked around the corner. I saw her. The woman was standing by a big gray door that was partially opened. The lights were off in that area so it was hard to see her clearly. But I could see she was holding a gun. She had long blonde hair. I stepped out from behind the corner to begin approaching her. But she went through the door and disappeared into the room behind it and closed the door behind her. I ran up to the door and pulled at the handle. She had locked it. I was banging on it and calling out to her, but there was no answer. The door had a deadlock on it. I yelled out to my partner to go get the custodian to unlock it. It seemed to take forever. Finally, the custodian came around the corner with my partner. When he saw which door it was, he just said, This door? Are you sure? I'm like, yeah, she went through there and locked it behind her. He said, that's the cold room. The door doesn't lock from the inside. I didn't know how to respond to that, but he found the right key and unlocked the door. I'm yelling, we're coming in, put your hands up. I had my gun ready and got inside the room. My partner was swinging his mag light to light up the corners. The custodian hit the light switch and the room lit up. It was empty except for some equipment against the wall and several gurneys in the middle of the room. All of the gurneys were empty except for one that was covered in a white sheet. The sheet was covering what appeared to be a body underneath it. I remember thinking how ludicrous this whole thing was. What a place to decide to hide yourself. I approached the gurney, and it was the smell that made me pause. It smelled like a corpse. I had been around plenty of them. I finally pulled the sheet down, and the woman was lying there. She had straggly blonde hair all around her face. There was no question in my mind that this was the woman I had seen by the door. I finally came to my senses enough to check the tag on her toe. It said she had died the day before. We just stared at each other in disbelief. I mean, what can you say? We had all seen her, and we couldn't all be crazy. You could tell how shaken the custodian was. He had been working there a long time and never seen anything like it. I swear it had to be a ghost. I'm writing to you today because I work for a temp agency, and I just left the strangest government job, and I need to tell somebody about this. Four months ago, I got a job working on a government project. On the first day of work, about 50 other temp workers and I walked into this huge empty warehouse. There were six men in suits sitting at a conference table with a projector aimed at the wall. We were told to gather around the conference table to have a meeting before getting to work. One of the guys in a suit stood up and he gave a speech saying, from this day forth, we were heroes. We talked about the children's lives we would be saving by working hard and sending pallets of much needed food to the places in the world that needed them most. He went on and on about how every minute we waste is a children's life that could have been saved. He appeared to wipe a tear from his eye and left the room. I'm pretty sure that tear wasn't sincere, but it set the mood for the rest of the four months. We all worked like animals sending truckloads of pallets to the children in need. I worked as a forklift driver, and I didn't take a single break for the entirety of the time I worked. I would just take a quick lunch break, then I'd be back on the forklift and load pallets into the trucks to be sent off. The pay was pretty good for a temp job, but for a government job, it seemed to be absolute chaos. If OSHA inspected our warehouse, they would have shut it down in minutes. We didn't wear any protective gear. We didn't take any breaks. And we worked in a poorly ventilated warehouse without AC in the middle of August. We didn't receive any training whatsoever. No food or water was provided. I could go on and on. Every night after my 12-hour shift, I would be so exhausted that I had trouble making the drive home safely. But the pay was pretty good. About three weeks into the job, I got promoted to a management position. I was pumped because I got more pay, but I didn't know the first thing about how to manage an operation like that. The biggest perk was that they brought in an air conditioner trailer for me to do the paperwork in. The other workers looked at me with hate, 
that I couldn't complain. One day, a truck drove off the loading dock with a forklift driver still inside. The forklift fell off the back of the truck, and the pallet he was carrying crashed on top of him. I shut down the operation and checked on the forklift driver. He was in bad shape. He couldn't move because of the pain, and a bucket of chemicals that were in the pallet poured all over him, and his skin was burning. As we were trying to help get him out of there, all six of the suited men ran out to the parking lot. The one that did the presentation on the first day screamed at us for halting production. I explained to him that the forklift driver, we'll call him Peter, could have died and needs immediate medical attention. The suited man had a breakdown that I was undermining his orders and was selfishly putting my friend's needs ahead of the poor children's needs. I was speechless. He screamed at everyone to get back to work and they did. And everyone just ignored him and kept working. The suited men pulled out rubber gloves and picked up Peter and took him into my trailer. They locked the door and I didn't see them for the rest of the shift. We just closed one dock where the forklift was blocking accessibility and continued working feverishly. I had never been in management before when there was an on-site injury. So I did some research and learned the standard operating procedures to fill out an employee report injury form. Thinking I was doing the right thing, I filled out all the information, printed it out, and gave it to the suited man. The next day I went to my trailer and it was still locked. I knocked on the door and immediately one of the men pushed me back and closed the door to the trailer. I handed him the form and he immediately asked me how many copies I made. I just said the one and he asked which computer I used to make the form. I explained I used my home computer and he immediately took me to his car and had me give instructions to my address. We pulled up to my house and he followed me close behind. I went inside to grab my computer. He immediately grabbed my computer and threw it in his trunk. I started yelling at him and he gave me $2,000 in cash to get another one. My computer was only worth $300, so I took it. On the last day, I walked in and the trailer was gone, and the warehouse was almost empty. The only thing in there was a conference table and the suited men. I walked up to them and they handed me an envelope with my last paycheck in it. They said that the project was top secret and I couldn't talk about anything that had happened here. I agreed and I wished them the best. I walked outside and opened the envelope. There was a $20,000 bonus in there and a note that said silence. The temp agency has me working for a pest control company now, so things have settled down drastically in my life. I do often wonder what we were sending off by the truckload and whom we were sending them to. It wasn't food for children like we were told. It was some sort of deadly chemical, and I don't know who was ordering so much of it. I also don't like the fact that those people know where I live. Mm -hmm.